Uh, we are continuing a new series this morning that we started two weeks ago, looking at what is one of the strangest books in the Bible. It's a book that many Christians don't look at. Uh, it's a book that I enjoy reading immensely, and it's the book of Ecclesiastes. So if you uh, don't know where it is, the index is incredibly helpful. If you've got one of our church Bibles, page 669 will take you to where we're going to be today. If you haven't, I do recommend the index. This book relentlessly asks tough questions about life. Questions that undermine any confidence or trust in human wisdom, in money, in possessions, in human pleasure, or in human justice. Its themes, and one of the themes we're going to look at this morning, and uh, you're going to be a bit uncomfortable this morning with some of the things that we're going to look at. It's one of its themes is how frail and fragile human life is. And therefore, how important it is to seize the day. This book is particularly relevant at this time as it challenges many of the values of the culture that dominates here in the UK and cultures in other parts of the world as well. I'm not going to go into the background of Ecclesiastes today. On our website, in part one of this series, I will, it's there, you can listen to it, I talk about that. So let's pray together, and then I'm going to ask you what were the key things that we learned last time two weeks ago. So while I'm praying, you can be thinking about that. Is that okay? Well, as you know, we're going to do it whether it's okay or not. So um, both pray and I'm going to ask the question. So let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is a living word. It's not a dead word. And Father, I want to ask for us all today as we look at this strange word that you are going to speak into our hearts, into our lives, into our minds. Father, as I often pray, I don't just want us to gain information today. I want us to receive revelation about our lives and about you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, can you remember, those of you who were here, who was here two weeks ago? Excellent. Who doesn't want to admit they were here two weeks ago because they can't remember a single thing that was said? <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. Uh, so what were the key things that we saw? We looked last time from uh, chapter 1 to verse 11 of chapter 2. We're starting at verse 12 today. What were some of the key things we saw last time? That without God, everything doesn't seem to have any purpose. Does that make sense? Very good. I was going to say the same thing. Without God, life blessings, everything is meaningless and has no value. Mm -hmm. Very good. Anything else? That even the best doesn't have any lasting value without God. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, how clever you are or knowledgeable you are without God, it's nothing. Very good. Well done. Good summary. And remember, we looked at two phrases that I want to, to talk about. But remember the phrase we looked at, under the sun? Th throughout this book, whenever you see the phrase under the sun, it means that, when, that what the writer is doing is looking at life imagining that God is not there, that there is no God. Under the sun means looking at life from a purely human perspective without God. And the other word that occurs time and time again is that word meaningless. And uh, we, we looked at it, it's, it's a little bit like, uh, like smoke, like a, like a vapour. It's got no substance, it's got nothing to it. So... We're going to go back into that today. So we're starting at chapter 2 and verse 12. And uh, the title for today is A Time for Everything. 
And just to encourage you, this first part we're looking at is called Everyone is Going to Die. Verse 12, chapter 2. Then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than what has already been done? I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise man has eyes in his head while the fool walks in the darkness. But I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. Then I thought in my heart, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise, I said in my heart. This too is meaningless. For the wise man like the fool, will not be long remembered. In days to come, both will be forgotten. Like the fool, the wise man too must die. You know, our English society today, it was not true a uh, hundred years ago, but it is very much true of our, our society today, tries to ignore the reality that everyone is going to die. In fact, we try to avoid talking about death. We've got now a whole stack of euphemisms. We don't say, oh, my uncle has died or my friend has died. We say, oh, they've passed over or they've passed on. Or, you know, if we're feeling a little bit irreverent, we might say, well, they've kicked the bucket or whatever. You know, we've got all these phrases just so we don't have to say that word, death. When someone dies now, in, and I know this isn't true for everybody, but the thing that the family want to do most of the time is as quickly as possible, let's get that dead body out of the house, out of sight, out of view. Because there's something really uncomfortable by having a dead body around. I, I'm meet people in just in conversation um, who've never seen and these are adults people in their 30s 40s 50s they have never seen a dead body I mean they, they've seen them in the films you know and on the news but they've never actually seen a dead body you know you, you go to funerals English funerals here and okay we've we've got a coffin but in our culture here it's closed there is this death denyingness about our culture. But we need to face up to this reality. So I'd like you to turn to the person next to you and say, I'm going to die. <laughs> and now, calm down. Look at them and say, and so are you. <laughs> you know, and all the laughter and all the other stuff that's going on around the room just illustrates how against our culture that is. You know, in many other more traditional, we would, we would say, us, us European people would like to say, less sophisticated cultures in our arrogant nonsense that we think about ourselves. Actually, death is a part of life. I, I remember, um, I, I've been to, uh, I've spent time in, in some different parts of Africa over the years, and I've been to funerals. And I, I, there's one in my mind particularly at this moment because it's such a contrast to what happens here in the UK. I, I, I was taken to a, a funeral and it was an old lady who died of old age. 
So it wasn't a tragedy. It, it wasn't that she'd been cut down in her prime. She, she died of, of, of old age. And um, she was, uh, excuse the English expression here, a cantankerous old bat. I mean, that was very clear in, in the discussion in the funeral. You know, when people talked about her, they talked about how difficult that she was and, and how, you know, and so on. Do you know how many people were at the funeral? Over a thousand people. Because, and some of them didn't know her. They just know that this old person had died. Because for them, you know, and I've taken funerals here where I've had two people at the funeral. Grand total of Two. Not counting the person that's dead. <laughs> I don't just mean me and the person that's dead. I mean two mourners. I've taken many funerals with less than ten people present. I've taken funerals where, where close relatives have said to me, I am not going to come to the funeral. I've taken funerals where husbands have declined to come to the funeral of their wives. What is all that about with our culture? It's because we're so sophisticated, us Europeans. Rot. <laughs> Nonsense. It is a reality. And if we don't face up, you know, most people go through life avoiding that reality. I mean, it's... The one, of thing, one of the things in life that you can be certain about, in fact, it's probably the thing in life you can be most certain about. And then some charismatic evangelical Christian, I, I, you know, quite fond of charismatic evangelical Christians, but what they'll say to me, Pastor, you can't say that because Jesus may come back first. Absolutely, he might. But if you're just saying that to try and avoid thinking about the fact that you might die you're just in that same denying stuff. Later on in Ecclesiastes, we're not looking at it today, the writer says, I'd rather be at a funeral than a party because actually you get a more realistic perspective on life. We'll come to that later on. So we need to face up to this reality. And I told you Ecclesiastes is an uncomfortable book because it deals in the realities of life. Uh, the writer here reflects that a life lived that walks in the light is better than one that walks in darkness. That is clearly the statement here. But to quote someone that I read this week, um, I like this, the seemingly black and white contrast between wisdom and folly dissolves into a sea of grey before the indiscriminate reality of death. Because death comes to people whether they're rich or poor, clever or stupid, good or evil. It makes no difference. Death still comes. And remember when he's writing, there is no clearly developed idea of life after death. That's much later. At this point, there was no, there was a concept that sort of, there was this sort of like, somehow people continued in some sort of shadowy, in fact, the word was shades that was used of, of what happened to people after death. But there was, it wasn't a proper consciousness. It wasn't, it wasn't the way that we think about life after death at all. So he goes on. So... I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. Remember, under the sun. The work done under the sun, ignoring God, was grievous to me. All of it's meaningless. A chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. And yet he will have control over all the work into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too 
is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a man may do his work with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then he must leave all he owns to someone who has not worked for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What does a man get for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labours under the sun? All his days, his work is pain and grief. Even at night, his mind does not rest. This, too, is meaningless. So under the sun, you look at life with your eyes open and it's utter despair. Remember that the writer here is characterizing himself as the wisest person ever to have lived. And he's doing that to just try and show the extreme, even the cleverest, remember last time, even the cleverest, even the person that's achieved the greatest things, even, even, even all of this, and still, under the sun, it has no meaning. In the shadow of death, it all seems to have been pointless. There is no way under the sun to guarantee that a person's possessions or reputation will continue after their death. We know elsewhere in the scriptures that God guarantees the work of our hands for eternity when we work with him. But this is life under the sun. So, that's all good news, isn't it? So what do you think? What's your response to this that we've looked at so far from verse 12 down to verse 23? What, what are you feeling? What are you thinking? For those of you who are in my uh, teaching sessions for the first time, I should explain that as I go through, I ask questions. And they're not rhetorical questions that I'm going to ask the question and I'm going to tell you the answer. These are real questions because I want to get some response. I want you to engage with this passage with me. So, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? It's not just about our, what's going on in our brains here, it's about also what we're feeling in response to what we've looked at so far. Hopefully, we're going to discover more because at first look, you could think, well, then what's the point of doing all this, doing all this struggle? Why don't we just live for ourselves, enjoy it? Because we're all going to die anyway. But I'm sure you're going to show us why that's not the case. <laughs> yes, but perhaps not today. <laughs> but good observation, yeah. I'm just thinking it's clearly not the case and everyone's... I mean, he's saying what he's saying, but it doesn't necessarily... You don't have to believe that, you know what I mean? Because not necessarily under the sun, everything's that bad f for some people. It's just this writer saying that. So it's a bit difficult you know, under the sun, lots of people are enjoying their, their life. They're not, they don't find it meaningless. They're finding it okay. They're enjoying their life under the sun. They're enjoying it, but what he is saying, and uh, remember, this isn't just some random writer. This is a part of God's word that we're looking at here. Uh, and it's a difficult part of God's word and a strange part of God's word, but it is God's word. Remember, what he is saying is that when you look at it with your eyes open, you're absolutely right. A lot of people go through life, living their life, as we looked at last time, just for pleasure and enjoying it all. But he says, when you look at it with your eyes open, actually it's got no meaning. It's got no, got no point. There's no substance to it. It's just vapor and, and smoke. It's not about whether they're enjoying it or not. But when he looks at it with his eyes open, he despairs. Absolutely. Um, makes me wonder, what's the point of a will? Because uh, if I work with wisdom and all my strength and then I leave it um, to somebody, they can just waste it. Yeah. Uh, so what do I do? Mm. That's the question. Actually, the more interesting question is when we die, why have we still got loads of stuff that we've amassed that we haven't put to good use? That's a more interesting question. 
just I throw that back in. I think Jesus says something about building barns and putting loads of stuff in barns. I'm on my way to you, John. It's just, it's a long walk. Um, uh, I think Jesus did say something about that. I'm still struck as I was last week by the fact that he's very singular here. That he's, he's talking very much from just, just himself. He's, he's very isolated in, in this conversation. And he's also trying to control things which are beyond his means to control. Hence, hence he's saying, I could do all these wise things and I could leave something to people and they could waste it all. Yes, and your point is what? Um, he, he's almost creating his own meaninglessness in doing that by trying to deal with things which are not his business to deal with. So one of the things that's occurring to me is how tightly do I hold on to things? And should my grip be looser than it is because a lot of those things I can't control anyway? Yeah, very good observation. Anybody else? Yeah. Sorry. Um, if I look, it, look at it as in a lemma's way, as a non-believer, I would say, yes, that's, that's the way life is going. It's rolling like, uh, like I'm, 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 an, I'm an hamster in a cage. It's just rolling, nothing is happening. So I, I get at all this and still it's all meaningless. But if I look at it in a, in a believer's way, then I can say, yes, it's meaningless, but what do I do about this right now? Oh, that's a very, very good question. Have you, have you read the next chapter already? <laughs> because that is actually where we're going very shortly. Uh, when we get into the next chapter, that's, uh, uh, I'll come back to that, Hannah, because that is a really, really good, uh, good observation. Okay, we're going to have a, a little break from the misery. Um, verses 24 to 26. It is only a little break because it's only three verses. But uh, a little break from that. So, uh, some of you might like this. A man can, and you know, women as well, so it's one of the, uh, I, I, I wish we, we, we we're, when we get a new version of, of scripture that we're going to use for teaching, we're going to try and get one, we're looking to move to one that's more gender inclusive, so we don't just get men or women or all that. So people, I'm going to just change that, can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their work. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the man who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. A different perspective here for a few verses. We'll get another glimpse again a little bit further down. Uh, a perspective not under the sun but with God in the picture. It's a recognition that actually food and drink standing for a lot of stuff in life and our achievements are actually gifts from God given to us to enjoy. He's not saying that enjoyment is wrong at all. So actually, would you turn over with me? Let me um, uh, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'm just going to put this mic down a moment. Let me read to you from, uh, we're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, and then we're going to jump over to chapter 6. So 4 and 5, 1 Timothy 4, everything God created is good. Yeah, I, I, amen's all right with that. Everything God created is good. Well, I think I heard half a dozen people saying that. Should we, should we give it another go, do you think, Pastor Warren? Everything God created is good. Nothing is to be rejected because it's, uh, if it is to received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. Over the page to chapter 6. 
Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men and women into ruin and destruction. The crunch issue here concerns how we live our lives. If we live to please God, it leads to enjoyment that is genuinely satisfying. If someone chooses to live life under the sun, there is no way to deal with the perplexities of life. People are just left with what one writer I read this week described as the frustrating business of amassing what cannot be kept. Love that turn of phrase. The frustrating business of amassing what cannot be kept. Which goes back to the comment that you made earlier on. I think people should make wills. But actually, I think that when people reach a natural end of their life, they shouldn't have stacks of stuff just piled up because God's given it to them not to enrich the bankers with whom they've got it invested, but actually for them to use for God's glory. Just I throw that in. There is a choice. Again, someone else I read this week. There is a guy called Eaton, he writes this. We, we choose the vicious circle of a pointless world, temporary pleasures, fruitless work, futile wisdom, and inevitable death versus an enjoyable life taken daily from the hand of God. So let's reflect on life for a moment not under the sun. Life with God in it. Because most of you here this morning live your life in some sort of relationship with God. So for you, when you look at these issues that we've been looking at in this, uh, in this chapter so far, how does our relationship with God change the way that we see these issues from this perspective of life under the sun. What do you think? For you. So this could be a testimony. It could be some thinking aloud. How does it change it? When you're not under the sun, when you're in relationship with God, how does this issue of, of work, of sometimes the fruitlessness and the meaninglessness that life sometimes feel, the fact that uh, the inevitable ending of death, how does that change the way that we deal with, that we see, that we feel these issues? Mm. It's not an easy question. You know, sometimes I ask you questions and you can just look down and say, oh yeah, in verse 6 it tells us the answer to that, but it's not one of those. So let's see how we get on. Um, on I'm thinking of two things. One, as a Sunday school teacher who teaches kids, but also uh, as like a missionary who goes out and tries to tell people about God. Um, you can, as a Sunday school teacher, you could teach youngsters you know, about God and, and such and feel like you're never getting through. But you just have to trust that God would use all that effort and all that, that you've done somewhere in their life in the future. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be there. And similarly, if you're um, telling people about God, uh, you may not see any conversions, for example, mm -hmm. but you trust that, that God, over the bigger, bigger plan and picture, um, will bring people to himself. Mm -hmm. uh, spoken for those of you looking at this on the internet, this guy's a missionary, so... Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
So we don't have to be concerned with the outcomes because actually the outcomes are in God's hands. That's in essence what you're saying. Whereas some, someone who's living under the sun, the only hands are theirs. Whereas for someone who's living under God, actually it's God's hands that are more significant than theirs because they can trust it into God's hands. Very good. I saw hands somewhere. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's something that frees me from having to decide whether to follow the world, you know, and um, sort of keep up to date with the Joneses. I can just say, what I'm doing is what I'm doing. In my heart, I know it's right. So it's a freedom thing for me. So. Very good. Other thoughts? Okay, thinking not under the sun, I think um, it also makes you joyful. L looking at um, by others, um testimony, we talked after the after first part, that you, sometimes you think you're, you're saying something about Christ and it's not really thinking it. And then when you Sometimes we, 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 we can be blessed to see the result, the end result, but sometimes we're not. But like she said, she, she was blessed to see the result that her friend came to know God. That what God gave to her, even though she was saying it out, she didn't think it was going to have an impact. And at the end of the day, it still has an impact. And also using Paris. Um, statement this morning before we started we were talking about how do we define success and he said I know God is blessing me and I, it's what I do with the blessing what I have the riches that God is going to give me I'm going to use it to bless others so you can, we can either keep it or and our master at the end of the inevitable will happen we will die and if we keep it someone else will, will waste it or we can do what God wants us to do with it while we're still living and um, enjoy the benefit at the same time excellent very good other thoughts I think I might have told this story before, but um, many years ago when we were just married, we got to take on a mortgage. And uh, it was that time when they put the interest rates up twice in one day to about 16% or something like that. And my manager uh, working with me, he'd just taken on a mortgage too. And he was running around the office like a headless chicken, panicking. And one of my colleagues looked at me and they said, aren't you worried too? And I said, not really. And I had to be genuine and say, well, no, because we've seen things turned around previously and we know that whatever happens, someone else is in control. And I trust that that's going to be okay. And they looked at me stunned and said, hmm, pray for me then, please. <laughs> Very good. Wine. Yeah, for me, it's... It's um, brought a peace. I was um, in, in the gym the other day and I was talking to a fellow about just life in general. And he didn't know I was the caretaker for the church. So he made this remark. He said, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to clean and wipe up stuff. And I said, well, that's your choice. But this week I had to clean up something really horrible. See? And <laughs> really horrible trust. Just say that Wayne is the caretaker here for those of you who, who don't know that. So this is a story about, I don't know how much detail to go into. We might have to edit that later. But is, is, it is about something that happened here in the building this week. Well, not actually in the building, but outside. Near enough. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I had to clean it up. And, you know, in my previous life, never... I would, I would not have gone near it. So for me, it's doing these things and finding peace in it. Like I say to everybody, me taking care of the church is not work. It's service, therapy for me. So being under the sun in my previous life, there was no... I can tell you straight, there was no meaning to it. I was looking for something that was unattainable. For now, underneath God's kingdom, everything I want and everything I do brings peace to my heart. Right, thank you. Just two more and then we'll move on. Yeah. Yes, I had an experience. My ex-husband and I, um, I work very hard and buy this house and I put his name on it, and 
when we separated and everything, the lawyer said he has to get off of it. And I said, oh, no, no, no. And it say, they say, it's the law. So I said to God, I said, God, you know how hard I work for this house and buy it and everything. And God would give me a piece and say, listen, I can give you so much more than this. And I stopped fighting him and rested in the, in the hands of God. And I'm looking at, in, in Ecclesiastic, you know, after he, he has worked so hard for everything, and knowing that when he die, somebody else would inherit, knowing that this person don't know how much that he has gone through to gain what he has. So what I learned as, as, as God de dealt with me to let go, because lay not your treasure on earth, but lay it in heaven, where there is no mud, no rust, nothing. So I learned to trust God, to say, God, whatever you have for me, it is for me, and this is just vanity, it just has all he says. Amen. Thank you. This, this whole thing of not holding tight onto things is, uh, is so important and, and recognizing that sooner or later we're going to have to let go because death's coming. But actually in the meantime, uh, we don't need to be holding on grasping it in the way that our society tells us that we ought to. We hold it with open hand. That's one of the really important lessons here. Yeah, I was struck thinking about verse 16 where it says, um, for the wise man, like the fool, they won't long be remembered. And there's such a lot of pressure these days for celebrity, to make a name, to be famous, to have status. That's without God. With God, then our life and our driving force is actually the name of Christ. So that's raising the profile of Christ and, and his kingdom. So what the, it's the... Um, Rather than our celebrity status, it's actually him placing him in his celebrity status, and that will go on for eternity. That's not short-lived. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the next passage. We're going to begin chapter 3, and we're going to read what is uh, the best-known passage in Ecclesiastes. We're going to read the first eight verses together now. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep. And a time to laugh. A time to mourn. And a time to dance. A time to scatter stones. And a time to gather them. A time to embrace. And a time to refrain. A time to search. And a time to give up. A time to keep. And a time to throw away. A time to tear. And a time to mend, a time to be silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. This section that we're looking at now in my headings, I've called it Time. It's got an almost spellbinding rhythm, hasn't it, this, uh, these parallels here. It touches all of life's seasons and all of life's moods. Some of the things in here we choose. Most of them we don't. Right at the very beginning, you didn't choose when you were going to be born. And so on as you go through. And when you look at life under the sun, this feels like a hamster wheel, to use an illustration someone used earlier on. It feels like being in prison, dancing to a tune not your own. But when you look at it under God, 
with God in control. It's no longer like a hamster wheel. It's no longer like a a pointless, meaningless dance. It is meaningful because it's God-directed. And as in one of the testimonies this morning, the person said, I don't believe in coincidences. Well, under God, there are no coincidences. Under the sun, that's all there is. Let's read the next few verses where there's a really important verse that we're going to talk about together. What does the worker gain from his toil? I've seen the burden God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and do good while they live, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything that God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that men will revere him. Whatever is has already been, whatever will be has been before, and God will call the past to account. Look back at that verse 11. It's a very interesting verse. It says, God has also set eternity in the hearts of men. This feeling that people have, that there is something more to life than you can see, than you can touch, is something put into human beings by God. However, humans can't work it out by themselves. Some other writer, I forget who it was, uh, not someone I've read this week, that described human beings as having a God being made with a God-shaped hole on the inside. And, And people try and fill it with all sorts of stuff, but unless they find relationship with God, it doesn't fit. So let's think about that verse for a moment, verse 11. What are some of the implications of that? for us as people living in relationship with God today. In the hearts of people, God has set eternity. I'm really glad you're here this morning. Um, It's reminded me that God actually wants everyone to be saved. He's, He's got a He wants a relationship with every single person, uh, every human being. Yep, very good. What else? Also for me, I think um, when Christ came, it means to me that when Christ came, he said he's come to give us life and to give us life in abundance. And that he wants everyone to enjoy this life. And that's, it's life beyond, it's, there's, there's life here as, Life, there's also life after. I wish Steve was here. Steve's not able to be here this morning. Steve's our church evangelist because I, th- I think he will be so excited at this verse. Why would he be so excited, Warren? <laughs> you know Steve, I'm picking on you. And Andy's right at the back, so I'm picking on you. I f- well, the answer is... <laughs> the answer is, you know, we want to tell people about God... Inside of every person, they bury it, they hide it, they fill it with all sorts of material garbage. Inside of every person, there actually is the knowledge that there is more to life than you can see. What more does an evangelist need? (laughs) Sorry? That's the answer, answer, yeah. Can I come back and ask you now? (laughs) So there is that, you know, 
we have found some meaning and significance to life, or the meaning and significance of life in relationship with God. But people around us haven't. And we, we think sometimes, well, well, people aren't interested. Well, there is in the hearts of everybody something of eternity. Recognising, unless they bury it under stuff, that actually there's more to life than meets the eye. More to life than meets the eye. And uh, we have a message from God that actually can give some answers to that about significance. Do you want to say something, John? I can see you waving your hands. I'm going to walk to you with the mic because I, I can see there's something about this verse has really caught hold of you. So um, uh, I'm just going to come and ask you. Well, that's really funny. This, this actually came up in our, in our house group just, just the last time we met, we, we were discussing the whole idea of approaching an unbeliever. And I, I think it was because we were talking in the context of, is God everywhere? And we were saying, well, if God isn't in some sense in a non-believer, then he isn't everywhere. And so therefore, when you approach when you approach an unbeliever, you're not shouting into a vacuum, which is, which is what we so often think. We think somehow I have to get God from outside and stuff him inside somebody so that they can be a believer. But that can't be right, because if God is everywhere, then something of God must be deep within that person. And what you're actually trying to do is call it out so that they can see it, which is a very different picture and, and a very different kind of task because one is completely impossible fantastic thank you i'm glad you were waving your arms around in the air and uh... okay let's move on to the next uh, and final section that we're going to look at um oh no i want to say something else first then we're going to look on to the final verses that we're going to uh, to look at just the living under the sun as we've said leads to despair but those who choose to put their trust in God, as I've been saying, know that he has it all under control. Now, hear this. The crucial difference between a Christian and someone living under the sun is not what happens to them in life, but how they respond to it. Okay, we all live in the same broken world. We have the same mixture of the welcome and the unwelcome, the difficult and the pleasant. All of that comes our way, all of us, in different ways in life. The crucial difference, let's take Wayne for a moment now. I'm just going to use him as he's here, and I'm sure he won't mind. You don't mind, do you? <laughs> you know, let's just take Wayne. Let's go back to his previous life he talked about earlier on. When rubbish came his way, the way he dealt with that then and the way he deals with rubbish that comes his way now is completely different because he has changed in his essence and his whole approach to life. Those of you, I'm not going to unpack Wayne's story here, but those of you that know his story will just understand what I'm getting at there. But that's the crucial difference. So those of you who were here in the funeral a few weeks ago that we had here, of a 12-year-old from a strong Christian family who died in his sleep during the night. The response to that was, yes, grief, yes, sadness, but also celebration of life and all that God had done and what a blessing that child had been. And so in that funeral, there was... A huge celebration. And in fact, there was both mourning, literally mourning and dancing from the family at the front here around the coffin. Both mourning and dancing. So it's not what happens to us in life that is the difference. It isn't that you, know, you become a Christian and, and you have a really blessed life and uh, everything goes swimmingly well and it's all nice and lovely. That isn't how it is. 
I'm sorry, Chris. You know, I know that's a disappointment to you. It is that you have the Holy Spirit. You have God living inside of you. You have God in the world around the outside. You know Jesus is Lord. And how you respond to stuff, that's what makes the difference. Okay, let's look at the final six verses we're going to look at this morning in the uh, remaining few minutes. Um, So verses 16 down to 22 of chapter 3. I also thought, as for men, God tests them so they may see that they are like the animals. Man's fate is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so does the other. All have the same breath. Man has no advantage over the animal. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place. All come from dust and to dust all return. Who knows if the spirit of man rises upward and the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth. I saw that there is nothing better for a man than to enjoy his work because that is his lot. For who can bring him to see what will happen after him. The writer here observes, and I was talking to someone earlier on about this, that in our world there is a huge amount of wickedness. And wonders why there is a delay in judgment. His conclusion is that the delay is so that the true nature of a person's heart can be revealed. And if that person chooses to live their life Under the sun, the reality is that person is ultimately no different to an animal in their choices. Psalm 49, this is the last verses I'm going to read this morning and then we're going to draw to a close. 49, verse 13. This is the fate of those who trust in themselves living under the sun, and their followers who approve their sayings, like sheep, they are destined for the grave and death will feed on them. The upright will rule over them in the morning, their forms will decay in the grave, far from the princely mansions. But God will redeem my life from the grave, he will take me to himself. Do not be overawed when a man grows rich, when the splendour of his house increases, for he will take nothing with him when he dies. His splendour will not descend with him. Though while he lived, he counted himself blessed and men praised him. So men praise you when you prosper. He will join the generations of the fathers who will never see the light of life. A man who has riches without understanding is like the beasts that perish. Three key things to take away from this morning, and then I'm going to pray for us because it's time to, uh, uh, almost time to go and collect children. Three key things. Everyone's going to die. I thought I might get an amen to that. Uh, Yeah, yeah, should I try that again? Everyone's going to die. Life without God is pointless. And it's not what happens in life but how we respond to it that really matters and makes the difference. Let's stand together. Let me pray God's blessing on you as we finish this morning. I'm going to give you just a moment of uh, silence for you to make any response you want to make to, to God privately. Then I'm going to lead us in prayer. Father God, thank you that we don't have to live life under the sun. A life of meaninglessness pointlessness, frustration. Thank you that we have the invitation to live life under you. Thank you that as we do that, you help us to respond to the rubbish of life that comes our way. And thank you that as we serve you, you guarantee that what we do with our hands, because our hands are your hands when we're serving you, is guaranteed for eternity in its value and significance. Father God, thank you. Father, I ask that you'll help us this week 
when we're at work, home, college, whatever context we spend the bulk of our time in this week, help us to live lives under you, not lives under the sun. Help us to be people whose lives under you communicate the reality of significance to other people. And help us to awaken that bit of eternity that's inside the people around us, that we may have the opportunity to share with them something of the light of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.